This is Pulse 95. Pulse 95. It's the Morning Majulus. It's the Morning Majulus. Talking the stories that are shaping headlines, plus those that make you go, hmm. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the Morning Majlis, the show where we talk about stories shaping the headlines. It's me, Ahmed Daoud, with Rania Sadi, and we've got a pretty packed hour ahead of us this morning. Uh, first things first, we're going to interview Faisal and Nabuda, general coordinator of the Sharjah International Book Fair's Publishers Conference. And we're going to talk about the book and publishing industry amid COVID-19, how it's adapted so far, and what initiatives were launched by the Sharjah Book Authority to help mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. So that's going to be a pretty interesting discussion lined up for today's show. Plus, more to talk about. More to talk about in the tech world, because today Apple is holding a launch event where it will reveal this year's iPhone lineup. And they're saying this iPhone launch is a significant one. It could be the first um, major case redesign since 2018 and the expectation that iPhone's new iPhones or Apple's new iPhones will support 5G cellular networks, have investors hoping for a big upgrade cycle. So we're going to discuss um, uh, this fall's launch, which which is said to be the most significant iPhone event in years. So we're going to talk about what rumors have been saying and what to expect. Absolutely. And we'll also talk about what struggling airlines have been doing amid COVID-19 to drive up sales somewhat, including what they've done in Singapore Airlines. They turned a couple of airplanes into restaurants and it turned out pretty well. So yeah. <laughs> that's going to be a pretty Sold interesting. Out. Sold out. Absolutely. Yeah. Imagine going to a restaurant on an airplane. It sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, but hey, maybe maybe they did something with it. So we're going to talk about experience. Why not? That's right. Yeah. The novelty to it as well. I went to a restaurant on an airplane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so stay tuned for those discussions. Our text lines are open throughout the show at 4215. This is the Morning Majlis. This is Pulse 95. Pulse 95. It's the Morning Majlis. It's the Morning Majlis. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome back to the program. And uh, we're talking all about the publishing and book sectors here uh, this morning, uh, because with us uh, on today's show is Faisal al Nabuda, the general coordinator of the Sharjah International Book Fair's Publishers Conference. And uh, he'll be talking to us about the impact of COVID-19 on the publishing industry and what the Sharjah Book Authority has been doing to mitigate those effects. Uh, so uh, good morning, Faisal. You're on the program. Good morning to you too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having being me on with this us. Program. Thank you for joining Thank us. Uh, let's start talking about the initiative you have uh, uh, for publishers, the Virtual Publishers Club. What is it? Uh, what is it all about? Okay. So the uh, the Virtual uh, Publishers Club uh, came in uh, to fill in the uh, let's say the void. Uh, we used to have book fairs all around the world. Uh, with the professional uh, programs we here in Sharjah we have the uh, publishers conference usually prior to the to the book fair uh, during these book fairs and conferences around the world people would discuss uh, different uh, different ideas about uh, publishing uh, different ways in publishing different ways in printing uh, so we created in Sharjah book authority the publishers club to have a virtual platform uh, so this event can keep uh, going on. People can keep on uh, discussing these kind of issues in publishing and at the same time getting the solutions and new ideas shared between them. And um, what is the purpose and who is the main target audience here? The, the, uh, there are two, actually there are two, uh, let's say two, uh, the purpose of the uh, Publishers Club is to um, help the publishers mm. across the globe get in touch with their uh, business uh, partners, with their uh, publishers, with authors, with uh, printers, and discuss what are the better, better, best ways to do business at the moment. Mm. And at the same time, uh, it's for uh, people uh, in public to know more about the publishing uh, world. And this, this conference, uh, is it open for the public or is it only for publishers? The uh, Publishers uh, Club is open for the public. Anybody can register through our website. We usually do ads on Instagram, mm. Facebook, or social media before the program starts by five days. So people can register and get a link to watch the program. Uh, can you talk to us about uh, the impact that the coronavirus pandemic has had on the book and publishing sectors? Uh, for instance, how did it affect book sales? 
it uh, it affected book sales uh, hugely uh, many publishers in the let's say in the arab world uh, didn't have uh, ebooks before uh, this uh, actually forced them to go into this kind of uh, business and having uh, e-commerce uh, selling books online having their books trans- trans- have transformed into ebooks uh, audio books uh, because at the time of uh, i mean corona many people um, would like to you know they wanted to have new content they wanted to have a look at new books different books but they couldn't get books uh, from let's say from egypt or it's, it's a bit hard at the moment so they had to go onto audio books and whoever had the uh, audio books online benefited from this and what kind of topics have been discussed in the previous sessions the first and second sessions so uh, yeah at the first session and in the second session also uh, the topics uh, hovered around uh, marketing uh, at the age of uh, sort of the time of uh, corona mm. how can you use uh, use uh, short social media how can you use the internet to your uh, benefit uh, at the first session we had uh, dr majdi uh, from uh, mahi publishing house from egypt he talked about uh, different ways and how to uh, market and sell your book uh, through uh, social media th- through the internet and how to make use of these uh, platforms and the second uh, session also they had uh, they talked near the let's say not the same topic but it was uh, from a different point of view the publisher himself he he used to do all of these things but he talked about a new and uh, innovative way Uh, and also to uh, distribute his books uh, through different kind of platforms uh, using a new websites uh, new designs and um, uh, basically uh, marketing in a better way yeah and and uh, is that is that part of an overall trend in publishing uh, the use of online platforms can you talk to us about where it's heading in the future now that uh, we've had this pandemic go on i mean um many publishers uh, let's say from this side of the world realized as i mean that's the way to go that's the way to be you should you should be there on the social media you should have a better uh, platform uh, you should market your book in the right way uh, many of them are realizing that right now and they realized that during the coronavirus pandemic because they didn't have any outlets to sell their books or market their books they used to do it only during or through book fairs yeah. and at this time we have no book fairs So they had to shift the way they think and the way they uh, sell and market their books. And uh, do you happen to know specifically uh, in terms of the types of books and the way they've been selling during this period? Have you been noticing specific trends? For example, education books, are they being sold much less nowadays or more? Uh, fiction, do you have any information on that by any chance? I mean we I mean we know and we notice and we try to uh, let's say um, monitor these kind of things through publishers but at the moment we don't have anything uh, precise but we do have like you know we get some kind of figures from the uh, from the publishers uh, they uh, they usually they say it's like fiction at this time uh, educational books came through when the schools started and people used to uh, study uh, online so uh, many people used to also buy these, uh, these educational books but we don't have a figure for that right now and as far as the prospect of seeing this uh, industry recover um, are you more optimistic about this taking place uh, within the end of this year what, what what are the the prospects here for the recovery for the publishing sector now that we've been through this uh, pandemic i mean um, It's a different, I mean, you, you can see it from many different uh, angles. Yeah. Uh, some publishers uh, actually benefited more from this pandemic, some. And uh, many of them had to change the way, like we said, the, the way they sell their books, the way they market their books. So I am optimistic, um, let's say until the end of the year. Uh, also, we have now in, in November, Charge International uh, Book Fair uh, going on. and we have the publishers conference i think this is going to create a, um, a push for the publishing industry and it's going to have a huge impact on supporting them and 
let's see how things go. I mean, mm. and uh, they got the book fair taking place uh, from November 4th to 14th. Everybody's looking forward to that. Uh, can you give our listeners a glimpse into what to expect uh, during this unique edition that is set to take place on November? I mean, it's a, it's a unique edition, as you said, but uh, you should expect having the same. Uh, we have a huge number of exhibitors, uh, publishers participating, uh, publishers from, from all around. Uh, so, um, I mean, so for the untrained eye, the, the book fair would seem the same uh, because you have the, uh, the full expo center filled with publishers, exhibitors, uh, all of the time, many titles will be there. Uh, Arabic and English and also different languages. Um, the Publishers Conference will be going on prior to the book fair. Uh, we have a good number of publishers participating, looking forward to buying and selling rights. So uh, hopefully it's going to be a good book fair. Hopefully, and uh, we look forward to that and covering it as well. Uh, really exciting developments happening. And uh, Sharjah Book Authority always keen on uh, keeping the publishing sector alive and mm-hmm. even innovating it uh, these days. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Faisal Nabuda, General Coordinator of Sharjah International Book Fair's Publishers Conference, uh, for this conversation and for giving us that glimpse into what is happening with the book sector. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, up next, we've got more stories uh, to discuss on today's show. The Apple event that's taking place today that's got everybody talking. What announcements to expect and how is this set to shake up the tech sector? Stay tuned for that and so much more on Pulse 95. This is Pulse 95. Pulse 95. It's the Morning Majulus. It's the Morning Majulus. Got the big Apple event oh, kicking off today. Yeah. It's today, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's really uh, in like uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time in the United States. So about 10 hours from now, approximately. Uh, so it's going to be taking place later today. Yeah. And uh, they're expected to reveal the new lineup of the iPhone 12 smartphone. And they're saying it's the most significant iPhone event in years. It's very- I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much to look forward to. Uh, yeah. It's a pretty significant one because of the timing of it. Uh, there were delays due to the outgrowth of the COVID-19 pandemic, which disrupted electronics across the world. Yeah. Uh, so this year, it's a significant launch. It is expected to include the first major exterior redesign since 2017 when Apple released the iPhone X with facial recognition. Uh, this year's models will also feature iPad-like edges with flatter sides compared with the gently curving sides of the current iPhones. Apple is also expected to release four separate iPhones at different screen sizes and prices. So it's a pretty wide range of device that they're set uh, to unveil during this event. Yeah, I mean, you know, in most in, in, in most recent years, Apple uh, announces normally its iPhones in September. Yeah. This year is different. We're gonna, they're going to do it in here now in October, <laughs> obviously, um, because of the coronavirus. But yeah, this year's iPhone launch is significant. Why? It is expected to include the first major exterior redesign ever since 2017 when Apple released the iPhone X with uh, facial recognition. And this year's models will feature iPad-like edges with flatter sides compared with the gently curving sides of the current iPhones. Also, Apple is expected to release four separate iPhones at different screen sizes and prices, which is a wider, a wider um, much wider actually range of devices than in the past. And uh, also, fi- last but not least, at least some new iPhones will support 5G cellular networks, which promise faster download times, although the networks aren't fully built out yet, for example, in the U.S., which could disappoint some users, but it's it's a nice feature to have. Yeah, the, fi- the 5G thing is huge, and uh, it's pretty much a game changer here. The first iPhone with 5G, yeah. that's definitely got everybody talking. Uh, and this is uh, pretty notable as well to investors uh, who are uh, shareholders of Apple's. I mean, the fact that this is uh, one of the few big changes that Apple's uh, committing to. The last time Apple made such huge changes to an iPhone. 2014, back- right? Yeah, it was yeah. 2014 when the iPhone 6 came out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's when they had the bigger screens going on, the different sizes. And this prompted what Apple calls a major upgrade cycle, a super cycle, with over 231 million iPhones sold over the next four quarters. So this is a pretty big game changer. This new upgrade cycle that the iPhones are going through is set to make Apple an even more valuable company, according to analysts. I want to ask you a question. It has probably nothing to do with the, the <laughs> new uh, event, but I just remembered I, I, I own a, I still own 
an iPhone 6. And the first iPhone that I ever uh, owned was an iPhone 4, and then a 6, and then an 8. I don't know what happened to the 4, <laughs> but I know that I still have the 6, even though I don't use it, but I still have it. And um, the 8 I, I use right now. Um, but I want to ask you, do you throw away your old phones? Not at all. I'm what a phone you, hoarder. <laughs> what do you do with it? I just keep them somewhere. I try to back up the memory into yeah. another device, but I keep the phone for memory's sake. And you never know. Sometimes you go through emergencies. Yeah. You lose your phone. It breaks down. Hey, I got another phone on deck. Maybe I could use that. So So how many phones do you have uh, stashed? Currently, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm stashing my 5S. I'll never let go of that phone. I think that's... 5S? Yes, yeah, the iPhone. That's the pinnacle oh. of, of design, I feel. It's this yeah. nice, it's true, small it's true. Yeah. Uh, iPhone, and it's got this jagged square design that I like so much. And it's yeah. it's one of the last lighter, smaller Apple iPhones because they've been getting bigger and bigger, and uh, my hands are pretty small, so I'd like my phone to be as small as well. But uh, there you have it. But I just want, I, I love looking back at my old phones because I have all those embarrassing photos <laughs> of me when I was younger. I <laughs> and think the all text of us messages. Too. And then you just like look at all the text messages and how you used to talk to people oh, and what yeah. you looked like. It just makes you feel like you are so naive and you're more of a devil now. <laughs> there's something so, you know? yeah, it's pretty sweet. Like there's something yeah. so life affirming about looking at stuff you had done years yeah, ago. Yeah, nostalgia. And, and a phone really is as just a conduit to your brain and mind at a particular period in time. Yeah. The places you went to, the friends you hung out with, exactly. the thoughts you had in your notes. And you have it all in one device and you go through and it's like a time capsule. And it's you're a just beautiful like, whatever feeling. happened, whatever happened to that person? <laughs> you know, like so many people in your old phone that are not in your life anymore, like, whatever happened to that person? Yeah. So you remember them again. And yeah, nostalgia comes back. But yeah, um, I want to ask the listeners, do you guys uh, keep keep hold to your old phones or do you throw them away? Or what do you do with them really? So just to do text us in at 4215. I really want to know. I'm curious to know. Uh, what you guys do with your old phones and what phones did you own before and what have you done with it? Do you throw it away? Do you give it to someone? Do you sell it? Do you keep it? So do text us in at 4215 to get involved and uh, keep us informed. Keep us informed. Ronnie and I, were the same. We hold on to our memories. Yeah. It's I pretty love, good to do I that. I love memories. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So do we. <laughs> well, up next, uh, we've got more discussions lined up on today's program. We're going to talk about the airplane that's been turned into a restaurant. Why are airliners doing this? Is that going to be the new trend as airliners struggle with COVID-19? Stay tuned for more right here on Pulse 95. This is Pulse 95. Pulse 95. It's the Morning Majulus. It's the Morning Majulus. Singapore Airlines, they're doing something really interesting with their grounded airplanes. They've turned a couple A380 airplanes into fine dining restaurants, and they've been doing very well. Yeah, and according to Bloomberg reports that all seats at the restaurant sold out within 30 minutes of booking uh, opening as people rushed to recapture the excitement of balancing a tiny meal on <laughs> a plane, basically. Uh, yeah, so Singapore Airlines is actually selling four different tiers of um, meals, according to Bloomberg, ranging from a meal in a suite for around $474. Can you imagine? Oh, goodness. That's like a price of two tickets together, <laughs> right down to an economy experience for the equivalent of $39. Around, um, around half the plane's uh, seats will be available for dining to allow for social distancing, of course. But yeah. Singapore Airlines is launching the dining experiences as earnings have plunged thanks to the pandemic. Back in July, the company reported a net loss of over 1 billion Singaporean dollars. That's about 825 million uh, American dollars in the quarter ending of June 30th. And at the end of September, it said it was also exploring other ways of making money as well as... Obviously, what, what are we talking about right now? Turning airplanes into restaurants. Turning airplanes into restaurants. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty interesting as well. I mean, people do people like airplane food? I guess people who miss that would enjoy this. Depends on what airlines yeah. we're dealing with. There are whole like websites dedicated to people reviewing airplane food. I'm I not going to bash any airlines. There browse. are some airlines that I don't like their food <laughs> at all. And there are some that I actually fancy. It's nice when they have a regional twist. So if an airline's from a particular country, they serve you their local dishes and stuff. It yeah. really, really takes your mind off things when you're on top of an airplane instead of watching the same movies over and over again on these mm. crappy headphones they give you. 
Uh, but other things uh, are happening uh, as, as far as uh, airliners and what they're doing with their jets during this difficult time where travel restrictions are imposed all around the world. Mm. We've seen, for instance, uh, Qantas uh, offering these scenic flights to nowhere in particular. So uh, these Australian airline flights would take off from the airport and go back there. But they would take you on a tour uh, showing you all these different locations, these yeah, oceans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a pretty neat yeah, idea. To, like to nowhere, right? Yeah. The flights to nowhere. Unknown, unknown pretty unknown much, destination. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and just ways that airlines are trying to seek revenue during this time. And that's essentially what Singapore Airlines are doing. They're running out of ideas. Doing. They're trying to get some money. You know, their airplanes <laughs> are sitting by. What are they going to do with those? Yeah. Well... <laughs> I googled actually the weirdest restaurants in the world because we're talking about restaurants right now. Yeah. And um, they have this idea on the airplane, but the weird. I was looking through the uh, the the uh, the list of the weirdest restaurants, or the restaurant i the, the ideas that they have, and in Taiwan apparently they have this restaurant. Uh, what is it called? It's called the weird the. Uh, toilet. It's bathroom. a toilet. It's, it's a to- yeah, it's a toilet restaurant or something. Goodness. And. Uh, it's just is it an it's actual? embarrassing it's embarrassing to even talk about it <laughs> but well, I'm um, looking at it now you're looking at the picture right yeah so it's uh, it's basically uh, there's a toilet in front of you uh, it looks like a toilet it's not yeah. a real it's not toilet a, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a mini um, kind of sculpted toilet shaped plate and that's what they serve you food on in Taiwan but in this in this in this restaurant called modern toilet. Yeah, it's a bit of, so weird. bit of a goofy concept uh, yeah. there. Even the the other containers, the salt shaker, for instance, yeah. they look, they're all toilet themed. So it makes you feel like, and even the chairs you're sitting on look like toilets. It's so. like, what do you feel when you eat from <laughs> a toilet shaped bowl? I don't get it. I guess it's the novelty of it. Uh, a lot of novelty themed restaurants out there as well. They've and got there's the- another restaurant that where you have... Um, Robots dancing for you. Robots dancing for you. Yeah. While you're eating. While you're eating. Oh, goodness. <laughs> what is the feel? That's in Japan, I think. Yeah. It's called the Robot Restaurant. It's in Tokyo, Japan. So basically, uh, you have like the side of, of, of strobe lights, beats, thumping beats, wild dance performances by robots. It's just, I don't know. But I feel yeah. like this this picture doesn't do it justice because I feel it's more hype if you're in it, like, live. Absolutely. I think what would be really fun if the if we went to the Disaster Cafe in Spain. Yeah. It literally simulates an earthquake while you're dining. So your table's shaking. Really? Things are fun. Yeah. It, it's a simulated earthquake. And do you know that concept? I don't know where it is. I think it's in the States, in the United States, where uh, you eat in the dark. Yeah, you know that one? Pitch Black, yeah. Pitch Black restaurant? Yeah. Uh, that is so weird. It is. How do you eat? They're banking on sensory experience. I suppose uh, they say at least uh, when your senses, like your eyes are not seeing anymore, your other yeah. senses get more heightened. That's true, that's true. So your sense of smell and taste is enhanced, enhanced. or different. Yeah. So that's the concept they're playing off like, of. Like, it's so weird. Like, you know, you have, like, you're, you're going with your friend. How are you, how are you going to have eye contact with your friend? So you just have to talk with nobody. Yeah. You just hear voice. That's it. I don't know. Isn't the whole point to it's be... It's the soul that matters. <laughs> <laughs> the soul that's present with me. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. the last thing that... I mean, the weird, the, the the craziest thing that I would do is just have dinner in the sky. That's it. Dinner in the sky. Yeah, that's I'm, that's the concept that I like. Terrifying for me. It's terrifying, but it's, it's an experience. It's a unique experience. Plus, if you have uh, nice views from up above, then Why I'm not? in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let us know if any of these uh, novelty restaurants speak to your interests. What's the strangest restaurant concept you've seen? Let us know by joining the text lines at 4215. We've got more discussions lined up on today's program. Uh, more books, literature, and fun for children here in Sharjah. We'll talk to you all about those initiatives right here on Pulse95. If you liked this episode of The Morning Majlis, drop a like and subscribe. 95. Be sure to follow us on Instagram for all our daily updates and top stories. Bubbles.